a, a portion of them, don't y'all laugh at me, and don't y'all throw, don't y'all throw no rocks at me. But in, in one of the chapters of my yet-to-be-released book, <laughs> watch it now, watch it, watch it. I, I, I discuss what I call the divine design of family. The divine design, in other words, God's design for family. Because, see, all I can go off of is how God designed family. I can't go off of how the sociologists and psychologists and all the, all the, the smarter people than I have defined family. I can only go off of what I call just my simplicity and my surrender to the sovereignty of the God who created family. Today, we're going to talk about how to leave a godly legacy for family. How to leave a godly legacy for family. I've been praying and fasting on this thing, trying to figure out how we're going to enter into this conversation, sis. Because it's a hot topic. It's a hot topic. Especially when you let everybody else except for God define for you what family is. And so, um, you don't have to understand it. We're still, we're still looking at the same passage out of 1 Chronicles 22nd chapter. Um, and, you know, and the one passage that kind of lifted, that kind of was lifted to me and which got me thinking about this family was a few, just a few verses. Verse 5, it says, Now David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and a house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent. Verse 6, then he called for his son, Solomon, and charged him. Verse 7, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, was in my mind to build a house, you know, to the name of the Lord, but by the word of the Lord, he told me to give it to you. I'm just giving you. Verse 9, behold, a son shall be born to you. His name shall be Solomon. And then verse 10, he shall build a house for my name. This is the Lord. But then David said in verse 11, now my son, may the Lord be with you and may you prosper and build a house of God. Now, what I want you to see in verse 17, really quick, he simply says, David also commanded all the leaders of Israel to help Solomon, his son. Now, I'm going to stop there because I'm, I'm really going to get into all of this next week. But what I wanted to do was I really wanted to discuss this whole concept of family and just in the introduction. So today is just simply an introduction. So y'all just kind of just kind of sit back and chill and relax a little bit. Today is an introduction um, into how we need to really understand how we need to leave a godly legacy of family. Okay, a godly legacy of family. And so. But that got me to thinking because of the life of David. We'll get, man, I mean, y'all need to understand something. David, now David, if, if, he, if there was dysfunction in the family, it was in David's family. But yet David still rose to be king. And then David crowned his son as king. But yet, despite the dysfunction that was going on in the family. Now, we know all, I'm going to let y'all know right now. Yep, 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 yep. We all got dysfunction in our family. Get that. And, you know, and, and so I, I will get more into that um, maybe today, but most definitely next week. But what, I, but what, what came to my mind is, you know, a, a portion of don't y'all laugh at me, don't y'all throw, don't y'all throw no rocks at me. But in, in one of the chapters of my yet-to-be-released 
But <laughs> watch it now, watch it, watch it. I, I, I discuss what I call the divine design of family. The divine design, in other words, God's design for family. Because, see, all I can go off of is how God designed family. I can't go off of how the sociologists and psychologists and all the, all the, the smarter people than I have defined family. I can only go off of what I call just my simplicity and my surrender to the sovereignty of the God who created family. So what I say to you may not, you may not like it, but I need you to understand. So really quickly, just a simple definition of family is just the descendants of a common ancestor, you know, of a house or lineage, just, just definition. But in my premarital counsel, I need, I need to be able to help you understand, you know, so go ahead and jump over to Genesis 1, verse 26 through 28. But in my premarital counseling sessions, when I would give, you know, um, you know um, premarital sessions to um, couples who want to be married, you know, I would stress what I believe to be what I call the biblical order of things, you know, when it comes to marriage and family. And so, Deacon Hawk, before we can really consider family, by God's design, we have to literally consider marriage by God's design. So I'm, I want to do just a little Bible study here because you know, this is this, today, y'all. Today is just Bible study. Today is just Bible study. I want to just walk you through just a few a few verses because see, the only way that I can define for you what marriage and family is is based off of what the Word of God says. I can't go outside the Word. Okay. Can't go outside the word. So let's see what the word of God says. Because before you can have a godly family, God's expectation of you and I is to have that godly marriage. Oh. So you mean to tell me, Pastor, that I ain't supposed to have children before I get married? Well, that's what the Bible says. But now, mind you, I know, I know, because I'm no innocent one either, that we have. And the good thing about God is that God's grace, <laughs> Lord knows God's grace, but that does not discount the expectation that God has. Because y'all know the very first institution that God created was the institution of marriage. And now so that he could, in, so that, that way he could then go and, 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 um, and then create the second institution, which is family. So y'all know before government was even around, before any other institution was even around, God, the first institution that God created was marriage. What does he say in Genesis 1? 26. He says something like this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, and according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds, and this and the other. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Verse 28, then God blessed them, and God said to them, what? Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion. Over the fish, over the birds, over every living thing. So, first and foremost, God literally ordains marriage, male and female. Oh, I know, I know. That's not what you heard. You know, with, with the you know with the equality of marriage act and all that stuff. And I'm not. Trust me when I tell you, I, I'm not. You no, know, demonizing and demagoguing that. I'm, I'm going to tell you what the word of God says. So, first of all, when you look in Genesis, and that term male and female, uh -huh. the term male actually means, the, the term it comes from the word zalkar, which literally means a male species. That's male. But then he says, and female. And he was very, God was very, um, very specific when he said 
and female. Because the female species, it, in this term, he, he, he called it, it was uh, nekeia. And that term simply means female or woman. When you see the term Adam or Adam, you know, in the, in the, in the Hebrew or in Genesis, many times in the Old Testament, that, that can mean that what we call our, our word anthropos or humanity. But God doesn't tell, he doesn't say man. He says male and female. Uh -huh. And he says male and female because we need to understand that God has called the family to be able to reproduce and to replicate. But you have to, in other words, for you to reproduce and replicate, you have to have a healthy male and a healthy female to reproduce and to replicate because that is God's design of the family. Walk with me now. So when you reproduce, that is physically, but to replicate means you begin to teach them to look like, walk like, act like, talk like, and be like God. So when the male and female re re reproduce, then the man and woman, husband and wife, then take that child and begin to dump into that child the word of God. Amen. Now, in, you know, in, 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 in my book, I, I quote somebody and I say, Dr. Diane Mockbar, he says this, the family is the nuclear social unit in a nation. All of the relationships in the society are based on the quality of life in the families and the lessons learned in those families. Mm. Now, let, let me slow down. And let, me, let, me, let me tell you what he says again. He says, family is a nuclear so social unit. In other words, we are the center yeah. of life. We are the center of society. And then be, by us being the center of society, he says that the quality of life in the family is based on the relationship in that family, the quality of life is based on lessons learned in those families. So the quality of life in that family then takes, and takes on its own life outside the family, in the schools, uh -huh. on your job, yeah. in the marketplace, yeah. and in society as a whole. Now, real quickly, I, I saw... Uh, I saw, and uh, I know, like I said, you know, I, I face, do a lot of Facebook, and so I, 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 I shared this thing about this young man who talked about, you know, um, the schools. He says, understand something. Quit, quit always blaming the teachers. Quit always blaming the government. Quit always blaming folk when you literally don't take and rear your child. Yeah. How God has called you to rear your child. Then you blame somebody else for the mistakes and for the misrearing of your own child, yeah. then you put that on somebody else because you've not done what God has called you to do. Yeah. But he first you know, said that it had to start with male and female. Right. Now, I, I got to keep I got to keep going because I need we got to stay in Bible study right now. So just just in case. You think that's just the Old Testament because your, your smart folks say that the Old Testament, you know, ain't, ain't really no good. Let's jump over to the New Testament in the book of Mark, the 10th chapter. OK, Mark 10, there's a discussion on marriage and divorce. We ain't going to talk about divorce. We're talking about marriage. Just let y'all know. So Mark 10, bro, just let you know, bro. We're just going to talk about marriage. Just marriage, about marriage, just about marriage. So, <laughs> so Mark 10 and then, and if you look at verse five, it says, because they're talking about divorce, but really Jesus comes back and he says, verse five, and Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he, Moses, wrote you this precept, Mark 10. But then verse six says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them what? And female. Now, understand, like I said before, I don't have all of the different words and verbiage of what they call, you know, transgender and this kind of this gender, that gender, and another. All I know is it says from the beginning, he said God created them male and female. But now wait, let's look at this, because the word here for male is a word called arsene. And that word, I'm sorry, arsene, and that word arsene means male. It means a male person. All right. Okay, it doesn't mean somebody who wants to be male. Uh -huh. 
It means a male person. And then he says he made them a male, and then he says that then what? Female. That word is thanus. That's female. That means a female person. So he says he made them a male person and a female person. And he says why? He says God made them, and he says for this reason, why? Because they're male and female. A man shall leave his father. That word is pater. That means male person. Leave his father and mother. That's mater. That means a female person. All right? And be joined to his wife. That word right there is gunas or gunais. We get to where gynecologist from, which means wife or female person. And so he says, for this reason, yeah, young with it, he says, and the two shall become one flesh. So they then, so then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Yeah. And so he says, I made you male and female because you need to understand that how I made you and understand my definition now of marriage is, the, is when you are joined together as one male to female. Y'all follow me? So we have to understand according to the biblical design. Y'all, I can't go outside of the Bible. I can't, I know, as much as it may, as much as it may be, you know, a socially um, acceptable, thank you, babe, I can't go outside of the Bible because marriage is a theological institution. It is an institution that is or that was created yeah. and ordained uh -huh. and directed yeah. by God. Yeah. And so I had to argue that just a little bit before we even get to the whole concept of family. Because understand that the biblical design is that you must be a full grown woman and a full grown man. <laughs> and you need, you need to be able to get together. So then because you're full grown, both man and woman, then you can make a baby. Now, let's really quick, I, I got to jump on this, jump off this, come see my introduction. When I say full grown man, full grown woman, I don't mean by chronology. You're not a full grown man or woman just because you're 18. You are an adult by man's standard. But you're not grown and mature by God's standard. <laughs> so, yes, you are a male, which is simply, you know, determine, all that determines a male is what's between his legs, all that determines a female what's between her legs. We got that. But then he said, but the next stage is being a boy. But you can't be a boy and be married because a boy is also very, you know, a boy is one who is, lacks discipline. A girl is one who lacks discipline. But what he wants you to be is a man, a spiritual man and a spiritual woman. Because a spiritual man and a spiritual woman together makes and produce what we call godly offspring. Now, I, now, just in case you think I'm, 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 I'm making that up, you don't have to go there, but just sometime in your quiet time, let's read in the book of Malachi, the third chapter. Listen to what he says here. I'll give you the verse a little bit later. He says, because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But listen to this. But he did not make them one having a remnant. I'm sorry. I'm sorry but did he not make them one? having a remnant of the spirit, and why one? Y'all ready for the answer? Yeah. Because he seeks godly offspring. Amen. So, godly marriage, directed by God, should lead to godly family, directed by God. 
if we followed God's dictates and in, in, in his direction, we'd be in a whole different state right now. But because we've decided to go away from what God has said, you have all hell breaking loose right now in this world because we decided we were smarter than God. We decided we knew more than what God knew, even though God created us. So he seeks godly offspring. So in other words, from a godly marriage, he wants godly offspring. See, I write in my book, I say that the family is supposed to be the incubator of our physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual health. Yeah. Let me say it one more time. The, the family is supposed to be the incubator of our, our physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual health. The family is the incubator. Yeah. But what happens is, in order for the family to be that, the the, the mother and father must be that. And the mother and father must be that because they are husband and wife. And then, in other words, and then if they're husband and wife, mother and father, and got the family, then the father who is head of the household, then what he does is he gets, he gets downloaded into his spirit what God says about the family. And then he teaches the family. But you can't have a godly family if you don't have a godly father and a godly husband because they're not hearing from the main one who has dictated, who have directed, who have, who, who have created the family. And so families are messed up, screwed up, all just, 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 I, I, I can't say some of the words I want to say, but we messed up. Because God designed it one way but we're trying to operate it in a totally different way without God. Yeah. <clears throat> the challenge we have, let me get back to my book real quick. The challenge we have <laughs> is that we have tried to define the family from the sociological realm. Amen. And only the sociological realm. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Because the family is a sociological institution in that it makes up and interacts with the community. It's sociological because it interacts with the community. There's a big old word called gregarious. The, the term gregarious simply means the ability to interact with other groups. All right. Okay? And so the family is sociologically defined by its, uh, listen to me now, is sociologically defined by its ability to establish and maintain relationships, constructive relationships or destructive. Mm, well. But when we define the family from this realm alone, we attack and we eliminate the symptoms of the alien family, but not the cause. So when you decide that family is defined only sociologically, you can deal with the symptoms. Bad grades, you know, the symptoms. Uh, you know, child that's misbehaving, the symptoms. Disobedience, the symptoms. A lot of this is what y'all see is symptomatic. This is symptoms of what's really going on. Yeah. When that child going to the school and that child cuts that teacher out mm -hmm. or that child is misbehaving in that classroom right. or that child you know, is, you know, is running around and, and creating all kind of havoc where the teacher can only, can only look at that child and not teach everybody else, it, that's a symptom. If that child is getting high at the age of 10, 11, 12, 13, that's a symptom. If that child is turning a bottle up as a teenager, that's a symptom. If that husband is coming home drunk off his behind, that's a symptom. If their wife is choosing not to, to no, not, not to no, submit and surrender to God, that, that's a symptom. We are trying to deal with symptoms. All I know is that, and I, and I heard it before, you know, I, I, here it is, here it is. You know, when I was going, I was away in Florida, right? And, you know, I, 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 told, I, I got there and I called, I called my wife and I said, I said, man, my, my, my eye keep, it just keep itching, it just keep itching. And, and I, I mean, I know, I mean, it was just, and then and it started to kind of puff up a little bit. I'm like, what's going on with my eye? 
Well, what happened is, and my, and my I forgot, my, my sister, she, she actually gave me the actual term for it, but ultimately, y'all, I had pink eye. I had pink eye. Now I had it. Now here, me and me and my wisdom, will me and my wisdom. I'm just gonna take a. I'm just gonna take a rag, right? Uh-huh. I'm just gonna put the rag on my eye, <laughs> and I'm hoping my eye go down. Well, after about a couple of days, it wasn't going down. So I decided to call Doctor Byron, and I said, Doc, I mean, hey man, let me. I'm gonna give you a picture of my eye. And so right away, he, he, he saw my eye. I said, Dude, you got you got pink eye. I'm gonna take you. I'm going to write you a prescription. I need you to go to the, pres- to, the, to the drugstore, get that prescription, put it in your eye, and your eye will be okay. All right. All right. Don't miss this. See, I was trying to address the, sy- sy- the, the symptoms, but what he was doing, he was addressing the cause of the pink eye. And so he gave me a prescription to be able to make sure that my eye was taken care of. Y'all, we are addressing the symptoms, but the prescription is called the word of God. You put a word into your child, I guarantee you there's going to be a different outcome. But if we continue to define the family in a sociological context without God, you will never allow your family to walk in the deliverance that God has called it to. You know, and so I I, I wanted to be able to at least share that with y'all, you know, because at the end of the day, the, 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 the family is not merely a sociological institution. Right. You can't define this simply by sociological terms. Right, right, right. The family is also not simply physiological. It's just not, it's just not a group of people. Right, right, right. It goes deeper than being a group of people. Yeah. I pulled up some definitions. I ain't going to even go into it. I only got, I only got a few minutes left. But understand, sometimes, even, even in that group of people that may share the common blood, you, there is nothing, there is nothing that, that you have in common. That's why I love when it says a common ancestor. We'll talk about that next, on next week because our common ancestor as people of God is Christ himself. And many times, you have to understand that you have to literally walk away sometimes from your physical family because your physical family is jacked up. Amen. And because your physical family want to do what your physical family want to do. Yeah. And they don't understand your walk with God. Uh-huh. And so therefore you have to literally let them alone physically. Yeah. And then walk with your daddy spiritually. Yeah. And then there's a spiritual family that will walk alongside with you. Yeah. Because your physical family has decided for whatever reason to walk away from God. Yeah. Don't you let your physical family... Lead you to hell. But the but the family is what we call a theological institution. I'm, I'll be done here. The family is a theological institution. In other words, the family is defined and directed and supported by God. When we look at family, y'all, I'm almost done. Give me about two minutes. I'm almost done. When we look at family, understand that God's definition of family, you know, from here, physically, of course, you know, father, mother, husband, wife, children. Okay. But then, yeah, there are other definitions that we can go to because then you have extended family. But understand, God's initial design and understanding of the nuclear family is one that he definitely directs. So when we look at the family, we should see a few things. Once again, just intro. We should really see the sovereignty and love of God displayed in that family. We should see the sovereignty of God and love of God displayed in that family. We should then see what we call submission and life of Christ. What, what do I mean by that? In that family, remember I told you the, the, the husband ought to be surrendered to God yes, sir. and submitted to Christ. Yes, sir. 
So in that way, if he is doing what, he, what he's supposed to do, then, then the wife won't mind submitting to, her, to him while they both lead the family. Amen. Right, right. But if that husband is not submitted to Christ, right. nor submitted to God, then you as wife can't submit to him because he ain't doing what he's supposed to be doing. Right. And he's going to lead y'all straight to hell. Yes, sir. I'm, talking about just divine, I'm talking about divine design right now. Because ultimately, marriage was instituted for procreation within this divine design of God, right? What you need to understand, and this is, this is what I want to share with you for this, this last thing. The reason why that's so important is because the family, y'all, listen to me on this one, and, I, and I, I'll be done. Listen to me on this one, and I'll get into the Davis family next week. The family and how it is structured is a representative picture of the relationship of the Trinity, I'm going to say that one, once again. The family and how it's structured is a representative picture of the relationship of the Trinity. What am I saying? Because the family and how it is structured, it is structured on surrender and submission, but it's also structured in hierarchy. Because in the Trinity, you have the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then God the Holy Spirit is submitted to God the Son. God the Son is submitted to God the Holy I mean God the Father. But they all are still one and they're working in one, they're working in tandem to go in the same direction. Father, mother, children, the family, when you are in hierarchical order and you are submitted to each other and surrendered to God, you have no other way, no other direction to go but straight and but up. But when you decide not to be representative of the Trinity in your life, people can't see God 